We are living in the greatest period in human history. A period of massive technological and economic advancement. Never in our history have we been so close to a world where we can live truly free and independent lives. But here's the thing. There are those with money, power, and influence who would rather see you dependent on them and the system they created. A system designed to keep you comfortable, apathetic, and distracted. We believe the road to true independence doesn't come through political elections or senseless regulation, but rather in maximizing the empowerment of the individual. If you feel the same way, then get ready. My name's Jason Stapleton. Welcome to Wealth, Power, and Influence. Oh boy, welcome back everybody. So glad to have you. So glad if you're watching the show. If you have nobody's catching this show live because I had to. I I I am greedy with my own time, and I decided that when I got married, in the little tiny space I have between when I get married and when I go on my little honeymoon, that I didn't want to have to record a show that day. How dare I, right? So, uh, but I do have an amazing show for you today. We're gonna be talking about something that that is really really important. If you want to control the source of your income. Now, I, I, I hate to go over this again and again for those of you who are really familiar with the show, but here's the truth of the matter. We got new listeners every day. We're growing like a weed around here, and I, I just feel the need to really kind of present the, the overall scope of what we're doing here so that you understand contextually why I brought our guest on today. So we happen to believe that uh, in order for you to maximize your own freedom, your own liberty that you need to, first and foremost, acquire rare and specialized skills, skills that will provide you and can command a high income. You also need to control the source of your income through entrepreneurship and investment. And more and more today, I'm, I, I used to say as best as you can, but I really think now it's a, an essential part of, of freedom. And what we would consider freedom is total autonomy, right? Being able to do what I want, when I want, where I want, with who I want, for as long as I want, without consideration for the cost. That's a tall order, isn't it? Well, in order for you to be able to do that and maximize your liberty and the forces that come down on you, your income needs to be mobile as well. So we focus around here on digital type businesses, consulting, things that can be done from anywhere on earth. And when you start thinking in those terms, when you agree, you're like, yeah, Jason, your idea of total autonomy uh, and your concept of wealth and freedom like that, I get that and I want that for my life, for my family. Well, now all of a sudden you're hit with a host of other issues, right? Like, am I going to have to take a pay cut if I leave the job? Well, oftentimes you do. Oftentimes the part-time business, in order for you to get it full-time and get it out there, you're going to have to take a leap of faith and leave the job so that you can devote the time that you need to the business so that it'll grow to the point where you can replace the income and, and then go from there. And what I've always said is the downside risk is always the same. Whether you work for somebody else, you work for yourself. The downside risk is what? Total and complete, like, failure. Uh, destitution. Living in squalor. Living in a van down by the river. Right? Those, that can happen no matter what business you're in, no matter what job you take. But the difference is when you choose to focus on controlling the source of your income, the upside becomes unlimited, doesn't it? Whereas there will always be a cap on the amount of money that you can earn. But sometimes we got to take a little step back before we go forward. Sometimes we got to take a pay cut before we can double, triple, quadruple, or whatever. And there's another problem, a big problem in America today, and it has to do with health care. There are a lot of people right now, I talk to them every day, who say, Jason, I would love to get out there and start my own business. I've got this little side thing going. I'd love to be able to do it. I just can't afford to quit my job. I got a wife, we got a couple of kids, we try to do, you know, we don't make enough money to be able to fund our own health care. And for a long time, there was kind of, there was a gap in this, there, there was like, so like a donut hole that, that was being filled by what are called, uh, what are called uh, health share accounts. And health share, health share, health, sa health share accounts are a little different than, uh, than insurance because it's a pool of people who come together and share each other's financial burden when they do have to go to the hospital. There's a whole lot of problems with this. I, was, I, have, I have a health share. I've had it for many, many years, but it's all kinds of problems with it. And I wish Matt was here today because I'd love for him to be able to tell you the story about when he had his, uh, had his son. They had a health share account. They had to pony up something like $10,000 to have the kid 
And then they had to wait 90 days to get the money back. Now think about that for a minute. There are very few people on this planet who can afford to do that. Just pony up and eat 10 grand. And my guest today has a new program out. He's got a new system. He's got a new company. And he's going to tell us about some of the problems that exist in, in the healthcare system today and also some of the things that we can be doing right now and some of, the, some of the steps that his company is taking in order to create that opportunity and give you guys the confidence to be able to go out and, and seek that better life without worrying about how you're going to provide for your families. So, guys, please welcome to the show, Andy, uh, is, it, is it Schoonover is that, or is it Schoonover? Schoonover. Schoonover. Okay. Well, you know, I'm, I'm the product of a public <laughs> education, so I'm <laughs> now. Andy, tell everybody a little bit about yourself. I like to rather than do. I want you to do the introduction. Tell everybody a little about yourself. Tell them about the company and uh, and what you're doing on the show today. Yeah. No. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate being here. Um, yeah. A little bit about me. I'll, I'll give you some history, some some background, give you some context for how uh, Crowd Health came to be. Um, I was running a healthcare technology company a few years ago, um, and we sold that to a private equity firm. I stuck around for a couple of years to help them transition. And as I, I rolled off of that responsibility, I lost my health insurance, um, as many people do when they, they lose their job or they, they quit their job or whatever it is. They get their ins insurance through their employer. And so I thought the only other option was to go to healthcare.gov. Um, and so I, I jumped onto healthcare.gov and, and got one of their plans. It was 1200 bucks a month and $8,000 deductible. And I thought, you know, I, it worked great until I actually had to use it. Uh, my, my, my wife and, uh, and two girls were using it. The littlest of which was one at the time, um, was having recurring ear infections. And so we go to the ear, nose and throat doctor and, and he says, Hey, perforated eardrum, um, we need to get tubes in our ears. So I was like, okay, well, let's, let's do it. Go to the local hospital, 15 minute procedure, $8,000. It was my first encounter with like, this is crazy. Any of us would take that hourly rate, right? Of, oh yeah. You know, $8,000 for 15 minutes. Um, I was like, all right, well, you know, I guess this is just how it works, right? Health insurance works. Um, so, and, and I have health insurance, so I, I'm assuming it's going to pay for it. Um, little did I know 30 days later, the health insurance plan said, we're not paying for it. Uh, it was medically unnecessary. So I'm like, hold on, wait a second. I have an ear, nose, and throat doctor looking in my daughter's ears, seeing a perforated eardrum, delaying his vacation by a day to do this because he was so worried about my, my daughter's long-term hearing loss. And some goofball in New York thinks that um, it's medically unnecessary. I'm like, you know, forget this. Uh, I'm not doing this. And so I, I called my health plan. I said, I quit. Um, I'm, not, I'm not paying you $1,200 if you aren't going to step up when my family needs help. And it was my daughter too, right? So us dads, especially if we have daughters, we get a little protective. I'm like, yeah, you know, sure. if you're not going to help my daughter out, then I'm, I'm not interested in, in paying this anymore. So, you know, I, I was pissed. And, um, you know, since then, over the last few years, I've, I've started building some tools that allow people to operate outside of the health insurance system. So um, can we yeah. can we talk for just a minute? I don't mean to cut you off, but I want no, I want to understand. You are probably closer to this than anybody I've talked to recently, and I want to really understand what's why the healthcare system is so broken. I understand that there is an intermediary, and that there's no direct understanding between the cost to the patient who's receiving the care and the person who's paying the bills, and so there's a disconnect there, and so you can't mm -hmm. maximize. There's ba basic economic principles there. And I also understand that there's a whole lot going on as, as it relates to government and the influences on the on lobbyists and stuff that keep a lot of this happening. But why is it that healthcare continues to go higher and higher and higher for things that should be getting cheaper and cheaper? An MRI mm -hmm. should continue to cost less, just like LASIK eye care is just getting cheaper and cheaper by the day. Uh, why is it not happening inside our health system? Yeah, and everybody thinks this is really complex, and it's and it's a pretty simple answer that I, I think your listeners will be surprised to hear. Um, so let's start with the health plans. Health plans um, have there's a federal law that says health plans can only make fifteen to twenty percent, depending upon the plan, of your premium in profit. So if you have a thousand dollars of of premium, they can only make one hundred and fifty bucks. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's an and Obamacare, outside, is that an Obamacare thing, it is. if I remember right? It okay, is, yeah. yeah. 
And so from the outside looking in, for people who don't understand economics, they say, that's a great idea. The health insurance should not be able to extract tons of profit. The problem with that is, is if you think about, you know, you just said it in your opening, like the listeners, you want to grow your income, right? So do health insurance plans. And so the only way to grow their income is to raise your premium, right? So if you're maxed out at the amount of profit that you can make per dollar, you're going to want to increase the dollar. So the insurance plans are actually incentivized for your premiums to go up, not go down. Okay, so that's one side. That's the the buyer of healthcare side of the equation. Now let's talk about the seller of healthcare, right? Those are the big hospital systems. The hospital systems clearly want the the prices to go up. They make more money. But then you you know the question is like, okay, you know, health insurance plans are supposed to be negotiating on our on our behalf, but they're incentivized for the prices to go up. And when they try to go into a city like Austin, Texas, which is where I'm from, there's two hospital systems. And if United Healthcare loses one of those hospital systems, they're screwed in Austin, Texas, you know, because no employer is going to go with the insurance plan that only has one of the two big hospital systems, given that half of their people go to that OBGYN and want to deliver their baby in that hospital and things like that. So United Healthcare is negotiating with a duopoly in Austin, Texas, and it's like this in most cities across the country. Okay. Okay. So let me see if I get this straight. So what you're saying is, is like, cause I always wondered, well, why does the, why does the insurance company continue to pay $800 for an aspirin, right? Or whatever un, ungodly numbers that they come up with in these hospitals. And, and what you're saying is, is they don't want to, but the problem is if they come back and try and negotiate too hard, the hospital might just drop them and just say, look, we're just not going to take the, your insurance anymore. And then they're going to lose half of the people or three quarters of the people who they do business with in that area because they're not going to go with the they're going to go with a subprime interest or uh, insurance program. Is yeah, that, is that right? Exactly. OK, exactly. And so, you know, think about the children's hospitals in your cities. Right. They have this brand name Children's Hospital. And so nobody wants to lose the children's hospital in your city or access to it. And so children's hospital can mark it up even another 20 or 30 percent because mm-hmm. they have a brand children's hospital. Um, so that's the problem. If you have the buyers of healthcare and the sellers of healthcare, both incentivized for the price to go up, the price is going to go up. Right. And that's the fundamental challenge that we have with our healthcare system is that you have buyers and sellers that want the price to go up. So then what is what is the answer, aside from what we're going to talk about with your company and what you're building, what is the answer for this? Is there a solution to this problem, I guess? Is there is there something that could be done that would that would be simple that would change the healthcare system in America you know, quickly? I mean, I don't I mean, it's the, the federal regulations, all of the you know, ACA, all those things are so ingrained to how we are doing things. I don't think there's a simple answer to that, but I would say um the, the, the answer is market forces, right? Mm-hmm. You have to introduce market forces into healthcare and right now they are non-existent. Um, and so really what we're trying to do, you know, at, at Crowd Health, and we can talk about it a bit, but is introduce market forces into a place where they're non-existent currently. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we're allowing people to negotiate on, on, on their own, which is great because I actually have more negotiating power with a hospital as an uninsured individual than United Healthcare does, one of the largest corporations on the why, planet. Why is that? Because you're just one person and you know, they so, want to get so, their money? Yeah, so think about this, right? Again, it's you know, United Healthcare is 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 negotiating with a duopoly. They can't lose, they have very little negotiation power. Mm-hmm. Me, on the other hand, um, let's just say, you know, I have a catastrophic event, um, and it was a five hundred thousand dollar heart attack, right? Um the, the, the hospital has one of two options. They can stick me into bankruptcy or they can negotiate with me, right? And in reality, most of the times in a crowd health, we can negotiate that down by 60% mm-hmm. and we can finance it over a period of time. So, you know, real, real story, $500,000 cardiac arrest negotiated down to $100,000 and that was financed over two years. So about $5,000 a month for two years. So if you can imagine having to pay $500,000 in one month or $5,000 over 20, mm-hmm. the costs of doing that are very, very different. Oh, yeah. Right? So I have more so negotiating that's life-changing. power. Yeah. It's life-changing. Wow. And there's actually federal law, Jason, that says 
if you provide a service without a contract, you have to, in good faith, negotiate with the person who received the service. You can't just uh, you you can't just you know charge whatever you want, right? Mm. The the guy who comes and mows your lawn can't just show up and be like, "Here's a five thousand dollar bill," right? They just can't do that. Yeah. Um, so it, it's it's called an open contract law, and that's that's in federal code. So the so that's, the that applies have, all fifty states then. Yeah, all fifty states. The the hospital has to negotiate with you. Okay. In good faith, um, and and I don't want to go jump ahead, but we at Crowd Health will actually negotiate that for you. And if the hospital refuses, we'll actually provide you attorneys to to yeah to yeah look, I, I i want to get to all of that i i, I, I thought, <laughs> i'm jumping ahead I'm no I, I get it i get it you're excited <laughs> I, and, and i am too i just i want to make sure that i lay i lay it out well for everybody so but I, I want you to explain what crowd health is and, and how it's different from say other health shares or other similar type of products uh, but before I do that, I want to tell our listeners how I found out about you guys. Uh, Dave Smith and I, every time a, an, an advertiser wants to advertise on this show, we once they come on, we end up doing a, a little get together and we get on the phone and we talk through the, the bullet points and the talking points and stuff. And I happen to be on a, one of those calls. They're typically very short, a couple of minutes, five minutes. And Dave Smith was on the call. Some of you guys know Dave. And, and, uh, and then you guys came on and I started talking with you about what you guys are doing at crowd health and i was so impressed that i asked you guys to come i asked you to come on and actually talk about it on the show because i felt like it deserved more than just a, a 60 second spot so uh, everybody the, the uh, crowd health is a sponsor of this show at least for a period of time uh, but that is beside the point i don't i can't remember if i've ever invited an advertiser on the show before which should tell you how how excited i am about this product <laughs> Uh, but I do want to I, I do want to let everybody to know that 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 that, this, that that's the case. But moving on, why is it so? One of the things that I know about health share accounts is that getting your money out can be somewhat of a crapshoot. Mm -hmm. You end up what you do is you pay into this system so that everybody else gets their bills paid. A portion of the money goes into this co the coffers in case they have overruns that they need to pay for in a given month, and the rest of it is distributed out to the people who need it. And when you have a bill, like, as you said, you went to that, you had to put tubes in the ears and it's like $8,000. You have to pay all that money up front and then you have to wait until they decide to reimburse you. And that could be, I mean, I'm a, you were telling a story about three years, somebody was waiting, but mm -hmm. I know 60 to 90 days is just like the bare minimum. And so talk to me about crowd health and how you guys are different and what you're trying to do to solve some of those problems. Yeah, sure. No, and we were as we were building the company, we were looking at some of the alternatives, and there's a number of them out there. And health shares is one of those alternatives. And it's like, what are the pain points of some of these alternatives? If you were to start from scratch, how would you do it? Um, and you know, one of the pain points we heard was these health share organizations just don't pay out with with a um, any any kind of you know short amount of time, right? And so that puts people in really difficult situations. And many times they actually have to go out and, and, and get a loan to pay off the hospital so that they don't go to, um, you know, a, a collector, uh, a debt collector, and that ultimately will impact their credit score. And so we're like, man, we, we just can't do it that way. Um, so we've changed things. We've done it completely different. You're going to be out of pocket very, very little in our situation. I'll, so I'll give you three examples. The little ones, Primary care physician, OBGYN, pediatrician. My my daughter just had a pediatrician visit uh, yesterday or the day before. It was 150 bucks. So my wife goes in, says, "Will you give me the cash pay rate?" Um, they're sure it was 150 bucks or something around there. Um, she paid it with her credit card. She took the bill. She, we have an app um, where you take a picture of the bill on our app, and on the back end, it there's optical character recognition that will tell us. How much it was for? What was the code? Was it the right code? We do it kind of the adjudication on the back end, and if it you know passes, then we ACH that money directly back into your bank account um, within four to five business days. Is that um, and is that all automated? Like is that just, or is all, that somebody actually automated. physically looking at it? Okay, mostly automated. The only time it wouldn't be automated if if our back end system says, "Hey, something sketchy is going on here," um, then we take a manual approach to it. Got it. Yeah, and that, but so, that's for that's for a rather low ticket 
hundred dollar low office ticket visit. Yeah. You, so let's say you go to the primary care physician and the primary, you know, you tweak your knee playing soccer or something, right? You you go to your primary care physician. Primary care physician is like, wow, you looks like you may have torn your ACL, right? Mm-hmm. So you're going to need to go to an orthopedic surgeon. So what you do with Crowd Health is you just let us know that you went to that primary care physician visit. We'll follow up with you. We'll say, hey, how'd your primary care visit go? Um, and they'll say, well, I think I tore my ACL. I need to go to see an orthopedic surgeon. So we call the orthopedic surgeon that you want to go to, and we then negotiate a rate beforehand for your ACL tear. Um, and then when you go actually in for your ACL tear, that orthopedic surgeon will already be paid. So we oh, pay wow. before okay. you get there. And, and as a result of that, the orthopedic surgeon or whoever it may be in that case will give us a significant discount mm. to what the health insurance plans are, are paying. So again, real story, Cincinnati, Ohio, um, knee replacement, Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield pays $40,000 for a knee replacement. Same doctor, same anesthesiologist, moved it to a surgery center, um, $22,000. Right. Yeah, so yeah. $18,000 was saved just for two reasons. One, we got it out of the hospital into a surgery center, which is actually a way better experience for a, a patient anyway. Mm-hmm. And we paid on the day. Um, so those two things reduced costs by, you know, almost 50%. Yeah, because the administrative costs of the doctors and everything goes down s- substantially if they don't got to chase the money and do all the paperwork and all of that. But is there is there a situation where, because I know one of the one of the questions that's going to come up is, well, what if they won't negotiate low enough for you guys? Is there ever a situation where you guys will say you don't get to see the doctor you want to see because they're just they refuse to negotiate? No, you can always go and see whatever doctor you want to see. We okay. will if there's another doctor in that city that does that has the same specialty, we will give you an option and we actually have quality data on the back end, so for a knee surgery, we can tell you how many complications per 100 your doctor had what their cost will be, how many complications per hundred this alternative one has and what their cost will be. And, you know, I, I don't know about you, but if you tell me that my doctor I want to go to is 15 complications per hundred and the doctor you want me to go to is two per hundred, I'm going to the two per hundred. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know? When I think about this too, I don't know if you've watched, you probably do, cause I don't know if you do, but uh, I love watching those like uh, those weird murder mystery whodunits and there was one dr death do you guys remember that where he had like 37 surgeries and he mucked up 35 of them or something and i guess for a long time you couldn't get that data can you guys now get that do they the hospitals keep that information yeah we we have that data wow we we can tell we can tell you what the good doctors are and the bad doctors are i'm gonna tell you right now that's worth more than uh, that's worth the cost of admission just simply to be able because that's that's got to be a fear every if i had to go in for major surgery I mean, every surgeon, if they're good, are going to be a little bit arrogant and they're going to talk themselves up because nobody, nobody wants to walk into the surgical center or into the OR and, uh, and have the doctor be like, well, I don't know. Yeah. Outlook, who knows? Like it's I'm going to do my best, but we'll see. Fingers crossed. That's not the doctor you want, right? You want the doctor to be like, dude, you're in the great, great hands. You're in the best place you could possibly be. Boy, you're lucky that you got me as your surgeon. Now let's get in there. But there's no way to qualify that. You don't know yeah. whether that bravado actually results in better care and a better experience. And so you guys having that data to me is extremely valuable in selecting somebody to do that sort of surgery. I, I can tell you if they've done a thousand knee replacements or 10 over the last year, right? Wow. And so you're going to want to go to the one that does a thousand because if they find something in surgery, which t- sometimes they do, the, the guys or gal has seen it a hundred times and knows how to, to get, to get it done still. Right. For sure. So um, that data is, is invaluable and a key component of, of how we, we try to direct people to the best docs. We're not going to force them that way. Um, but most of the time, if you tell them that this is a much better, higher quality doc and give them actual data, they'll go. Yeah. OK, so we got the, the cheap ones easy. You just pay out of pocket and within three or four days, you send them the money. If it's a more expensive surgery or something like that, you got to see a specialist. You let you guys know and you guys negotiate with them ahead of time so that you don't even have to worry about paying a bill. It's paid the mm-hmm. day the surgery happens. What happens? You get something really severe, like some cancer or leukemia or something like th- that would normally be like a death sentence. 
Yeah, or, or you know, like uh, so that or an ER visit, right? Like, oh uh, yeah. NICU, yeah, 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 NICU baby, right? Or a heart attack, or one of those things. Mm. You know, you get billed after the fact for those. So if you go to the ER today, you won't get billed at the ER. You're going to get billed thirty or sixty days later. Mm -hmm. And every bill that you get, again, you take our app, you take a picture of it. We categorize it. We put it in the right date. We know it's for your heart attack or whatever. We aggregate all of those bills. Once we know we have all the bills, then we go back to the hospital and we'll negotiate with that hospital on your behalf and then pay it. Um, so the only kind of caveat to that is you're 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 committed to the first five hundred dollars of any health event, mm -hmm. right? So in that cardiac arrest event. Uh, you're responsible for the you're 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 committed to that first five hundred. Well, yeah, but I mean that's that's crazy, Andy. Like five five hundred bucks is nothing. You you spend five hundred dollars every time you breathe in an emergency room. Like every time you take a totally. breath, they're going to charge you five hundred dollars. So as that, you said, the me, aspirin is five hundred dollars. Yeah, it's, that's 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 <laughs> crazy. And and I want you to say that again because I want everybody to to hear. This is what really shocked me, is that you guys go negotiate. It's not the client's responsibility. It's not my responsibility to go and figure out how to, you know, how to whittle these guys down. And you guys have a team of people who do that for a living. They're experts at it. Yes. And they go in, they handle that. And really, you're incentivized to get the lowest price possible because in the end, you guys in the, in the health, uh, crowd health is the ones going to end paying for it. Yeah. 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 You, the, yeah the, the community that you're in is, is going to pay for it. And so we are incentivized to get that down. We don't make... You know, so, so health plans typically they make their money by bringing in a bunch of premiums and then paying out medical bills, mm. right? And and the the difference is how much money they'll make, right? So they're actually incentivized to you know re, you know get to deny claims, right? Yeah. Because their their profits go up, um, and so we have no of none of that incentive. We're yeah. we're, we're just charging you twenty five bucks a month to be a part of the the a subscription fee. Yeah, that you know that that's how we make our money. So we actually are incentivized to grow the community, which we make more money, and you spread the cost over a greater amount of of people, and their so your costs go down. And so we are totally aligned with with the members of the community, mm -hmm. which is really really important for us. Well, and and as you guys, you are incentivized to grow because the more people that you have, you know, that that you can spread not just spread low the cost, but also the statistically the less likely you are to face some sort of catastrophic event where three people, you know, have, have or something terrible happen, and then the other hundred now are now you're kind of upside down. So the more people that you have in that program, it reduces your risk as well. Uh, yeah, totally. Okay. All right. So then what about something? Let's talk about, uh, I'm trying to think of a, an, another example that would be really good. Well, let's say this, let's say you go in and you get the knee surgery and the guy cobbles you. And now you're, now you've got the bills are piling up because you've got to go in and get it redone and you got legal that you're going to have to manage and negotiate as well. Do you guys do anything with that? Do you help out at all with that? Yeah. So if you have a knee, knee surgery, it goes bad and you have to go back for a, a second one. We were again, negotiating with the orthopedic surgeon to say, okay, you, you blew the first one. Let's talk about what it's going to cost for the second one. If anything, Yeah, right. Exactly. If you want us to continue to send folks to you, then, you know, what are you going to do on this second one since you botched the first one? Right. right? He's right. going to say we didn't botch the first one, but you know, here's the really important thing too, Jason is uh, doctors hate health insurance plans almost as much as you and I do, right? They spend 30% of their time dealing with health insurance plans as opposed to taking care of patients. Mm -hmm. And they are all trying to figure out a way to, to get rid of plans and go cash. Um, and so they love what we're doing. Um, and that's the only way we'll work is if they, they get paid quickly and they, they, you know, we help them and they help us. And so it's, man, it's, it, it actually helps that patient doctor relationship when you have somebody kind of, helping, um, you know, with the payment structure there, that's not in between them. You mm -hmm. know, we, we allow the doctor to tell the patient what they should do. We don't get in between. There's no pre-authorizations. There's none of that stuff. So, you know, that's one of the things that drives doctors absolutely bonkers. 
Now, what about what about the? Let's go on to some. Now, this is where we probably will get into some areas where you know that you, you won't be a good fit for everybody. That just needs mm-hmm. to be known right up front. But let's talk about a couple that because I actually don't know that you may or may not be good for. Let's say you got prescriptions that you're supposed to take because your knee got infected or whatever, and now the you go into the you go on to get the the prescription filled. Do you guys have any prescription coverage at all? Yes, we do. So our our prescriptions are about seventy percent less than what the health plans are paying. You negotiate um, those the same way? Is we, that why? We have a, a third party negotiating those for us. Right. Yeah. So on, it's really good on generics. Um, it is, it's pretty good on the brand named ones. Um, but 80% what about of the, the new, drug like, take are, I have several, I have several friends who are gay and they all take prep, which is a, like an HIV drug, whether you have uh, HIV or AIDS mm-hmm. or not, everybody's on it. And it's a very, very expensive, like three thousand dollars a month. Uh, how does oh, wow. how do you guys stack up with negotiating that kind of stuff down? Can you get those type of drugs, the really expensive ones, down? Yeah, the, the great thing. So here's what we'll try to do: is the great thing about um, being uninsured, which is we are. I've been uninsured for several years now, and I've loved it. Um, is that those drug companies will actually give you significant discounts for folks who are uninsured. Okay. So we help you on our side say, hey, go, let's go to the drug manufacturer. They all have a, a you know, a, a care, you know, program that they can get those drugs down significantly lower. Um, and if we can do that, then we ask you to go and, and do that, right? Mm-hmm. If it's a, the, the, the key kind of point here, though, is if you have a pre-existing condition, right, um, you, um, you are responsible for your pre-existing condition in the first year. Okay. So the 100% of the expenses in the first year, you're responsible for. So we'll type help you one, negotiate type two those. diabetes, type one diabetes, the ones with like, well, the people who wear the little insulin packs. I've, I had a friend of mine who, who had, a, his wife has, has that first year, they're out of pocket a hundred percent. They're out of pocket a hundred percent. Second okay. year, um, we, the, the, the community will, will, uh, cover up to 25,000. Second year is 50,000. Third year or third year beyond is a hundred thousand. Okay. So um, if you have a pre-existing condition, then you have to say, okay, my family saves about $10,000 a year on, on healthcare because I, I go with crowd health versus uh, uh, healthcare.gov. Uh, so do I have a pre-existing condition that's going to be more than $10,000 a year? Uh, I'll give you a, a great example. We had somebody the other day calls and is like, my son's on ADHD um, medication, Vyvanse, I think it was called, right? And it was mm-hmm. 300 bucks a month. So we kind of walk through the math and it's like, okay, it's an additional $300 a month, which we think we can actually get significantly lower by going to, you know, the drug manufacturer. Um, you, your family is going to save $7,000 from the, you know, your, the health insurance versus your, op, you know, and so you actually are still saving $3,500. And by the way, next year, um, we'll, we'll pay for it all because we pay up to 25,000, mm-hmm. right? So Wait. we walk through that math with folks. Is there a and way? most of the time, okay. it works. So is, is there, so I guess that, that kind of answers my next question is, is there a, is there a way then that you can go in and, and say, Hey, here's all the stuff that I'm on. Cause I imagine as you get older too, you get mm-hmm. a lot more stuff that you're taking. Is there a way that you can go in and you guys can give them somewhat of a, like at least a ballpark figure within, within an acceptable range of, Hey, here's what we think you're going to be spending extra that you're not spending now. And here's what you're going to be saving off of your premiums and, and your, uh, and your bills. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we, if we, we've had people, um, give us a list of medications and say, here's the medications I'm on for my preexisting condition. And we get a lot of, you know, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, those things. Those are mostly generics. Like those are 20 bucks a month or something. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, a family member actually gave me one three weeks ago, which is she had, she's on four medications. We walked through them. It was 60 bucks a month. So that's $720 a year that she would be responsible for because those are pre-existing conditions, but she's saving like 3,500 or something like that. And so, um, it just, it, the savings way outweigh the, the additional out of, out of pocket is, expenses. Hey, this is bonker. Why are, why are there not more people who are, well, let's, let's talk about, let's talk prices first. Cause I have another question that I want to ask you. So mm-hmm. you said $25, that's, that's the subscription, but you're actually paying, I think at my age, cause I'm over the age of six or whatever it is. I pay like 125 <laughs> or 175 plus the 25. Uh, give me yeah. some idea on the, on how the pricing breaks down. 
Yeah, so it's $25 to us is your subscription fee. And then if you are zero to five, it's $200, an additional 200. Mm -hmm. If you're six to 54, it's an additional 150. If you're over 54, 55 to 64, it is uh, 300. So, so for me, it's uh, 175 all in a month mm -hmm. and then a $500 right. deductible. You got it. Dude, yep. how, how do you make the, well, I mean, cause you guys, this is the other thing that I found really interesting. You guys don't have a pool of money like most health share accounts do. So most health shares have this massive pool of cash. So you say, oh, it's $175, but it might not always be $175 because if you don't need my money that month, you don't bill me the full $175, correct? It might be $150 or $125. That's yeah, that's totally right. So, yeah. you know, if, if for this month, I'm, I'm making up easy math numbers. Um, mm -hmm. If we have a million dollars of bills this month and we have 2000 families, it'll be $500 per family um, this month. Right. Mm -hmm. And if it's next month, it's $900,000 of bills, then uh, you have $450 per family. So the pricing from month to month is dynamic. So the number I gave you is the max we're going to ask you to contribute to the the crowd this month so okay so this is the million dollar question then is like okay if you don't need as much this month you don't charge me as much but what happens on the month when you really got hit hard lots of big bills came in how do you guys handle that without any like pool of of savings or to draw from yeah we actually think that the average um will be about 25 to 30 percent less than the number that i gave you so i can scale up 25 or 30 percent Right. And you're still and so okay. that gives us and you're still OK. So that gives us a really big buffer. Um, the other thing, too, is, as I mentioned before, we're financing a lot of these over a period of time. So you will not have multiple one million dollar bills in any one month. We're, we're, we're financing those over a period of time. It's zero percent interest. You'd be dumb not to do that. We do that for every other large expense in our lives, our cars, our houses, mm -hmm. you know, those types oh, of things. Oh, you should finance all of it. Yeah, you should finance every yeah. single thing at 0%. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and so it makes economic sense for us to do that. And that keeps us from having to pull a lot more money from you every month to build that pool on the back end, which is massively inefficient. Yeah. It's a way inefficient way of using your, you know, your, you know, imagine you telling your audience, yeah, just in case something happens to you, stick a thousand dollars a month into a pool that earns zero interest, you know, and let it just sit there. I mean, that's stupidity. And that, that's yeah. what our healthcare system does basically. Um, and so we don't, we're not doing that. You keep the money in your pocket until we need it. We can flex up if we need to, to that full price. We think most of the time it's going to be below that, um, you know, based, based upon, you know, some experience. Mm -hmm. And so we're very comfortable with, with that, you know, and look, here's, here's the other thing, Jason is, the, the world caves in and we have to ask you for an extra hundred bucks this month, you know, when I'm saving you seven or $800 a month, I think our community is gonna be like, you know what, we're going to step up and we're going to, we're going to do an extra hundred bucks this month. Cause yeah. that's what, you know, we do. Right. No, like, I could see that. And, and as long as that's not every single month, then that's fine. But, um, you know, I don't think that's ever going to happen, but you know, let's just say we have a, a 9-11 type of, of event where bunches of people in a small geography get hurt. I mean, it, it may it may happen. We can't guarantee that it won't, but that's one where I think the community will step up. And I, I do believe despite our craziness in our country right now, we, we do care for each other and we'll be willing to step up when, you know, things like that happen. Well, I, I think especially people who engage in, in the type of crowdsourcing and crowdfunding that you're doing in in this company i think they are predisposed to think that way and like oh i'm part of a community here we're sharing in in the bills and and it's it's reducing everybody's costs and this is a good thing for everybody and when there's a sense of community when someone is really hurting and we're like hey we've had a 9-11 event and instead of 175 this month we need we need as many of you as possible to pay 275 I was like, dude, I, yeah, there's, I can't envision a world where you would have any trouble doing that, uh, especially yeah. with the, the, the type of business that you're running. So what, what question have I not asked that you think the audience really should know about? Yeah, I mean, I think, who is this for, right? I mean, who, who are, who's the, 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 the customer that, that we're looking for? And, and your audience might be like, yeah, does this make sense for me or not make sense for me? You know, I, I think from, from, the customers we currently have, a lot of them are entrepreneurs, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of these people are working outside of big organizations, whether it's 
being a real estate agent, from my perspective as an entrepreneur, you're out kind of doing your thing to, to somebody wanting to start a new business, to you know somebody who's a solopreneur, um, to freelancers who are entrepreneurs from my perspective. I mean, it's, it's those folks who are kind of working outside of the, the big company system that will pay for your, your health care. And those, those folks are loving what we're, what we're providing because there's no other place to get, you know, something like this with this quality at such a, a low cost. So um, we're really excited about having those people, you know, and they're, they're the type of folks who will take care of themselves too, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. that, that helps the entire community. Um, so yeah, if you're an entrepreneur or, or somebody like that, we'd you know love to have you join us. Um, talk to me about how easy or difficult it is to actually get signed up. Is there a medical check? How do you how do you confirm pre existing conditions? What, what's the process when someone says, "Hey, I think this is right for me"? What what are they going to do next? Yeah, you can you can sign up. It's it's literally I made it through the sign up in about a minute and a half um, for myself, and so maximum it's probably three or four minutes. There's a, a set of member guidelines there, most of which I've kind of talked about on this on this call or this uh, this podcast already. Um, but you read through that. I mean, you can get through it in five to seven minutes. There's no pre medical checks. You know, the only thing we we ask is if you have a pre existing condition, just let us know you have a pre existing condition, mm -hmm. and don't join us if you have a pre existing condition and try to hide it. Because what happens, right? The worst case scenario is you've had a heart attack in the past. You have a heart attack and under our, you know, under our thing, our, under our uh, model. And then we found out you had a heart attack in the past. You didn't tell us about it. Um, and so that makes this heart, heart attack not reimbursable. Yeah. Right? Well, and that's and so on, like, that's on, that's on the other guy too. So if he wants to do that and wants to play those kind of totally. games, then and he so deserves sort of like, to get stuck with the bill. Yeah. Just, I mean, just tell us, <laughs> just tell us, um, you know, there are only two people that we, we, two kinds of folks we say no to if you're, a uh ob obese you know if you're over 300 pounds if you're a male over 260 if you're a female um, we'd love to have you join us when you you know get below those weights or if you're a smoker that's one where we so can't no do it on smoking okay. um you know it's those the cost for those folks are four to five times what the cost mm -hmm. is and it's just not something you know lung cancer will be a million bucks like that right yeah. so it's just not something that we can do so those are the only two groups that we we asked not to join, but other than that, it's super easy, super, super easy. Could you do easy. this same thing? I'm assuming this is just medical. It doesn't, it's not dental or vision. Could you realistically do the same sort of thing for those two different medical, bill, the medical bills as well? Probably end of first quarter or second quarter of next year, we're going to add uh, dental and vision. Oh, nice. That'll, that's great. Oh man, I got to tell you, I, when I, like I said, we talked for quite a bit on the phone when we were, when we were discussing the product and, and I, I just am impressed with it. I, I was telling, I think I was telling you, I didn't tell anybody else. Nancy, Nancy has got great insurance through her company that she's been working for, for a long time. And I, I'm jumping on her insurance when, as soon as we get married, but I was telling you before the show, Andy, I'm, I'm going to be buying your insurance as well as a supplemental just because number one, it's not that much money and I can support what you guys are doing. And I think that's important, even if, you know, it's, it may not, it's like, ah, oh, we're just going to throw, burn 175 bucks. Well, no, because you're supporting something that you believe in and, and something that you want to see continue. And, uh, and God forbid we ever run into one of these situations where the insurance company just says, nah, we're not going to pay for that bill because we yeah. don't think it was necessary. At least I got you guys in the background who are going to be willing to do the right thing. So that's absolutely. Really Okay. Yeah, so no, where, absolutely. Where do people find you? Where do they go? How do they sign up? Because I know we're going to have a lot of interest. Joincrowdhealth.com is where you'll you'll go sign up. Um, you know, if you have any questions, there's our phone numbers right there, our emails right there. We have a little chat bot thing too on our website. So if you have any questions, I know this is a little bit different than insurance. You know, it's not insurance, but um, you know, it is a different way of paying for healthcare, a little bit different, requires a little bit of behavior change. And so if you have any questions about that, you know, please, you know, reach out to us in any way. And one other thing, Jason, that I think is really important that we haven't talked about is, um, you know, one of the, the, the things I hate about health insurance or any large company in which I'm a, I'm a customer, I call into them and what do I get? I get all these robo, you know, yep, things. I talk to automated things. I talk to somebody in India. And I, then I talk to somebody, you know, I have to tell my story four or five times. Yeah. You have a dedicated uh, advocate within our company for you. So Jason, every time you call in, you will talk to Sarah, right? And if, 
and you, so you're, you'll get to know Sarah, you'll get to love Sarah, love Sarah. And so one of the issues that we've seen is healthcare is so lonely because you feel like you're on your own, right? In this case, Sarah will make sure that Jason and his family are not on their own. Um, she will walk you through the process, um, which is, you know, a huge differentiator between us and insurance and us and some of the health sharing organizations. We take a very engaged customer advocacy approach um, because this is a scary thing for a lot of people. Um, so we, we think it's, it's good to have somebody there that you know um, to, to walk alongside you. Well, this is one of those things that I, I've been talk, uh, talking about for a while is that if you – if you look around the world and you see that something's broken and it's not working right, what most people do is just complain about it. And and I've on this show, one of the things we try and do is we try and say, okay, we're responsible for building the kind of world that we want to live in. We're responsible for building the infrastructure for, uh, you know, forever with the next stage and where we're going to go. We're responsible if we don't like the way things are to see that they get changed and, and to blaze our own trail. And you're doing that uh, like in every single state. You, f- you check all of those boxes. And so I really appreciate what you're building and um, it falls right into our wheelhouse. And I'm glad that you came on the show and, and you were kind enough to give us some of your time because I, uh, this is one of those things that I really believe in. Um, yeah. We talked about Thanks, before, the, before the show. It was like, how do you ethically, how do you legally um, operate outside the system? You know, and mm-hmm. you've, you've done that. You've created a way to do that and others can join you. So thanks a lot, man. And uh, for the rest of you, I'll be back here to do this all over again next week. Until then, be safe. Be good. I'll talk to you then. If you enjoyed today's show, do me a favor. Subscribe and then share it with a friend. And if you're ready to take the next step towards controlling your life, income, and future, then I'd like to help. Just go to controlthesource.com to get started. 